Thanks very much for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to look at the severity of mitral regurgitation and parameters ranging from qualitative to quantitative, looking at both transthoracic and transesophageal echo. Can you hear better? Yeah. Firstly, with transthoracic imaging, if we look at the top image, this is the short axis view with the left ventricle, right ventricle, and we can see the mitral valve with the anterior leaflet. This is postromedial commissure with A3 and corresponding P3 of the posterior leaflet. Anterolaterally, we've got A1, P1, and the central A2 and P2 segments. We can look in parasternal long axis in the neutral position, and here we can see the central segments, so A2 and P2. And if we use this image and we tilt superiorly, we'll angulate towards the anterolateral commissure and we can see A1 and P1. From this neutral position, if we tilt inferiorly with the transducer, we will see A3, P3 and are interrogating the, the medial aspect of the valve. If you have the luxury of bioplane imaging, this is very helpful. So what we're doing here is sweeping through from the medial portion of the valve across in the next images to the lateral. With the bioplane imaging, we're seeing a short axis view through the medial aspect, so A3 and P3, and we're seeing the corresponding long axis image. And we can see that there's little mitral regurgitation at this point. As we move through, so we're sweeping medially through the medial aspect of the valve at A2 and P2, we can see there's more regurgitation here. And you can see that very well in the corresponding parasternal long axis image where you can see the mitral regurgitant jet that's arising centrally. And we can keep going through to the lateral aspect and we can see there's less regurgitation. So the, this 3D biplane imaging helps us to localise the origin of the jet and also helps with assessing severity. With qualitative assessment, we're looking at a range of parameters. We're looking at the valve morphology. So as we've discussed before anatomically, we're looking at the leaflets and the supporting structures, so cordy papillary muscles, the annulus. We're also looking at colour flow. <coughs> we want to know how big the mitral regurgita regurgitant jet is relative to the left atrium. And we also look at the continuous wave Doppler signal. So parasternal lung axis imaging, we're looking at the mitral valve leaflets. We can see that the anterior leaflet tip is relatively immobile, that there's a typical hockey stick deformity of rheumatic mitral valve disease. And there is regurgitation, a relatively small jet in the parasternal lung axis and also in the apical four chamber of mitral regurgitation. So along with the regurgitation, there's also obstruction to mitral inflow, so mitral stenosis, left atrium dilated, and there are also rheumatic changes in the aortic valve. So this, was, this is a cartoon of what we were looking at with the transthoracic imaging. With transesophageal imaging, because I'm going to show, show you some images shortly, this is inverted upside down relative to the transthoracic. So your posterior leaf is at the top, but postromedial is still on the left side of the picture. When we use the 3D toe imaging, the surgical view, it's similar to the transthoracic and anterior is at the top of the screen, but your lateral aspect is on the left-hand side. So this is a transesophageal image, a four-chamber view with aorta, anterior mitral leaflet, A1, 2, and posterior. And we can see the anterior, so A2, there's a flail segment and flail cord. And we're looking also at what the jet is like. So we can see there's a, a jet of origin, and it's eccentrically directed and impinging on the lateral aspect of the left atrial wall. And we know that these impinging jets look less than they are, and that's because the jet cannot entrain in motion the blood on the constrained side of the jet. So it's about, it looks about 40% less than it does if it was a central jet. We're looking at, at this image, this patient on transesophageal imaging. So this, is, this shows the A2 prolapse and the flail cord. Back to transthoracic. This valve looks thickened, myxomatous, and we can see that there's bileaflet prolapse back into the left atrium, and we can see this colour jet filling the left atrium of mitral regurgitation. Another transesophageal image, so this is an outflow tract view with aorta, um, A2 and P2. We can see there's a relatively restricted posterior leaflet and an unusual jet orientation, so we can see it 
arising from the leaflets but moving on the side of the annuloplasty ring. And 3D shows us what's happened here. So there's been partial dehiscence of this annuloplasty ring and severe mitral regurgitation. This is a very typical Royal Prince Alfred patient with, um, with secondary mitral regurgitation with a dilated, poorly functioning left ventricle. And in the short axis view, we can see that almost the entire mitral area is occupied with severe mitral regurgitation. And we've also put a limited mitral valve area, which, and the reason for that is that when we're assessing whether a clip will be useful in this patient, we want to make sure that we're not going to end up producing mitral stenosis. So we need a valve area that's more than four square centimetres on planimetry. Moving on now to the Doppler signal, so continuous wave Doppler. As the mitral regurgitation becomes more severe, the signal becomes denser, more complete, and this is in moderately severe mitral regurgitation, until in severe regurgitation we have the characteristic V cutoff shape because of the rapid rise in left atrial pressure. So to summarise this far, in mitral regurgitation from mild to severe, we've got increasing size of the jet within the left atrium, and we've also got an increasingly dense continuous wave signal and until we get a V cutoff sign. Coming back to this, this image that I showed you before of the bileaflet myxoma as well, bileaflet prolapse with a lot of mitral regurgitation, how severe do we think this is? Be very careful about the timing. So look at the Doppler signal here. And we can see that, in fact, the regurgitation is only in the last half of systole. So whatever we think the regurgitation is, it's probably only half of that, because we've got to correct for the duration of the, of the regurgitation in systole. And supporting that is the fact that the left atrium is actually not that dilated, is not dilated. And we'll come to this later, the E velocity is not particularly high. So it's, a, it's not just the size of the color jet, but the timing as well. Moving on to the semi-quantitative parameters, the, the easiest to use is the vena contractor, and this relies on, men, on measuring the size of the regurgitant jet at its origin, and the red line is, is illustrating the vena contractor. More than seven millimetres is regarded as severe amount of regurgitation. Semi-quantitatively, we can also assess pulmonary venous flow. So the normal pulmonary vein flow, systolic component, is more than diastolic. And as mitral regurgitation becomes more severe, systolic is less, as we can see here, until finally with severe mitral regurgitation, we have systolic flow reversal. And this is often better seen on transesophageal imaging, which is in the, the right-hand panel. Also, for semi-quantitative assessment, we look at the EV max, so the maximal um, mitral inflow with pulse wave. This is going down from mild to severe. We can see that E wave becomes dominant and we, we want an E V max of more than 1.4, 1.5 meters per second for severe mitral regurgitation. Something that we probably don't use sufficiently but which is helpful also is looking at the VTI of mitral inflow relative to the, the VTI of LV alpha tract or aortic alpha tract forward flow. And when this ratio is more than 1.4, it's consistent with severe mitral regurgitation, as we can see in the bottom panel. Then moving on to the quantitative parameters, we look at the PISA radius. So we can hear, see in this transesophageal image that there is flow convergence before re the regurgitant jet, and we can adjust the size of this hemisphere by changing the aliasing velocity, moving the baseline in the direction of the jet. And we can then measure the flow by measuring the area of the hemisphere and multiplying that by the aliasing velocity. And that is equal to the flow through the orifice, which is the area of the regurgitant orifice times the, uh, the Vmax of the CW of the, um, of the mitral regurgitant jet. You can rearrange that to calculate your ERO or to calculate your regurgitant volume, which is ERO times VTI, with the same signal. Severe mitral regurgitation is defined as an ERO of more than 0.4 square centimetres, or regurgitant volume of more than 60 mils. But be aware that you have to have a, a, a hemisphere to measure this accurately, and that eccentric or impinging jets may not be able to be measured accurately, and multiple jets as well. <coughs> 
always check. So go back to see, does your mitral valve EEV max fit with what you think your, your PISA is? Have you measured PISA accurately? Have you averaged over five cycles for atrial fibrillation? And so on. The other point to be aware of is that the cutoff of an ERO of more than 0.4 applies to primary mitral regurgitation. But for secondary mitral regurgitation, the ERO severe cutoff is 0.2. And there are a number of reasons for this, and this is an interesting paper, but importantly, PISA underestimates the ERO in secondary MR because of the crescentic shape of the convergence. And we know that secondary MR is associated with the worst prognosis, and we don't want to wait until an ERO of 0.4, which is, which is associated with really big end diastolic volumes in these patients. How do we measure mitral regurgitation in unusual situations, for example, after a mitral clip? The top panel shows a valve with, with reduced captation before mitral clip. The second shows the first clip being uh, oriented relative to the anterior and the posterior leaflet. And the final shows two mitral clips now in place. And we can see that there's this um, double orifice, this owl eye type appearance at the end of the case. We can't use PISA because we've got both a double orifice and multiple jets. We can use our semi-quantitative assessment, so we can look at the, the size of the jet, we can look at the e-velocity, we can measure the orifice size directly. We can look at pulmonary venous flow, and this is quite useful during the case. So at the start of the case, we could see that there was a very small systolic compared to diastolic component, and, what, and after placement of the second clip, there was a systolic predominant flow. We can also look at 3D color, although this is tricky to use, but we can use 3D on, on trisophageal echo. We can look at regurgitant volumes where we calculate um, stroke volume minus the forward flow. And in the longer term, we will look to see how these patients improve. So what happens to their left ventricle, their right ventricle, their symptoms, and so on. To assess mitral regurgitation accurately, we need a good machine, we need highly skilled sonographer, and the cardiologist also must be aware that heart failure management should be optimised before a patient is labelled as having severe mitral regurgitation, and this inc includes medical treatment and also cardiac resynchronisation therapy if appropriate. Be very aware of fluid status and loading as well when you're assessing these patients. When we perform TOE in these fasted patients with sedation, usually at RPA or anaesthesia if you're lucky, you are affecting the blood pressure and you are under, a, the mitral regurgitation looks less severe. So the TOE is often useful as an anatomical assessment but not really to assess the severity of mitral regurgitation. If your parameters are discordant, Look at those carefully and think about whether you should add something else like exercise echo. Exercise echo is really useful because it gives you an assessment of functional capacity. You can look at mitral regurgitation severity before and after exercise and whether there's an increase in the RO, which predicts um, severity. And we can also look at pulmonary pressures. And as with all echo assessment, we must make sure that all echo parameters are considered and correlate back with the clinical findings. Thank you. Michael, if you come up and set yours up, just while we're getting uh, Michael to set up, but there's a couple of questions for you. One is, um, uh, is there a role of the vena contractor in the very eccentric jets, or does it get confused by that? And the second thing, are you using PISA still routinely? So do you want to answer those while we just change the slides over? So I would try to measure all the parameters that you can, including vena contractor. And we, this, and we do measure um, PISA routinely, so we use it in every patient where we can, but sometimes with the really eccentric jets where it runs under the leaflet, you are unable to measure. So measure everything and look carefully at, um, at how good each parameter is and decide which to, to use for your final assessment. Okay, very good. Thank you very much.